On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. When my play is being performed and I'm in, in the house, if someone moves, I hear it and it bothers me. And of course, I'm extremely sensitive to the notion that my play will not receive its full reception if there's an interruption to the experience. But as a historian, I know that's not true. And also, really, as an arts consumer, I know that's not true. I know that people are capable of processing a lot of different stimuli. We do it all day long, and we can do it inside the auditorium. I don't want the lights up, and I also don't argue that we should be shifting back to the theater of Dionysus and to audiences coming and going and eating and playing cards and moving around and carrying on. It's more about our attitude about the audience's right to interpret that I think we need to look to the past for. Lynn Connor is Professor of Theater Arts and Chair of the Department of Theater at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. She is a theater and dance historian, cultural policy theorist, and playwright. Lynn has written extensively on audience engagement and the creation of meaning in the arts, and has won numerous awards for her playwriting and directing. Her most recent book is Audience Engagement and the Role of Arts Talk in the Digital Era. Before joining the UNC Charlotte faculty in 2016, Lynn was professor and chair of the theater and dance department at Colby College. In this episode, we explore social interpretation of the arts, how audience behavior has changed over time, and what we mean by meaning anyway. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Happy to be here. How do you describe yourself professionally to the world? I say that I am a cultural historian and a working playwright. I was trained as a theater historian. I branched out into dance history and then ultimately into a wider cultural history where I'm really looking at theories of audience behavior and social interpretation of the arts. So I like to use the term cultural historian because it shortcuts all of that. You are also a playwright. I am. And I say working playwright because I, I think that's important for artists to be able to state that they are actively engaged in, in their work and that that's the measure of being a playwright. I'm a playwright because I write plays. I'm also a playwright because my plays are produced and published. Um, but most importantly, it's because I'm really actively engaged in the process of making plays on a regular basis. And you are also a professor. And I'm a professor and an administrator now. What courses do you teach? Well, currently I'm not teaching very much because I am chair of a large department, but typically in, in my career as a college professor, I have taught theater history, I have taught dance history, I have taught playwriting, and I have taught a range of courses which, which fit inside the larger umbrella of citizen arts and arts for social justice. So I teach courses that help students to develop a practice of making art that is explicitly about helping communities, building communities, and allowing communities to express themselves through, in my case, theater. Lynn, in the broadest terms, what is your scholarship about? My scholarship 
is about the application of the history of the arts to the practice and the larger social mechanism of the arts. So as a cultural historian, as a theater historian, as a dance historian, I understand the past and I regularly relate that to why it's relevant to what we do as artists today and what we do as arts workers, which is a term I use for everybody, artists, administrators, educators, everybody involved in the, in the larger arts industry, the industry in the best sense of the word. There is a thesis, a central assertion to your work about audiences and the arts experience. What is that assertion that drives your work? So fundamentally, the assertion is that the meaning and value of the arts is rooted in what I call the arts experience, which is not the arts event itself, but the experience that surrounds the arts event, including what an audience does to prepare for an arts event, the experience the audience has while consuming the arts event, and then, very importantly, what the audience member does with that experience in their own mind and in their engagement with others afterwards. That's the total experience of the arts. We have made a mistake in the way in which we sort of articulate or even advertise the arts, that it's just the thing that happens, let's say, in the concert hall or in the theater. But that doesn't make any sense. That's not true. We are fundamentally interpreters. Human beings interpret. That's what makes us human. That's what distinguishes us from other animals. And without acknowledging that, we cut the audience off from that critical aspect of, of the arts experience. The central focus of your work is the audience and what the audience does and experiences. You even use a term called audiencing, thinking of the audience as a verb. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk more about who the audience is and when you say audience, what do you mean? Audience is complicated and maybe a little bit troubled concept because its roots are, of course, in the word audio and, and so in the in the concept of hearing, but we don't mean that today when we use the term audience. We mean everybody who is spectating. Spectating is a term that has fallen out of usage and its application was about seeing. But an audience member is the person who is there to take in the work, whether that work is a live performance, whether it's a piece of art in a gallery, whatever the context for the audience's experience. The, an audience member is the ultimate of the equation. Without an audience member, we get into a troubled territory of, you know, trees and forests and things falling and being heard or not heard. So obviously, studying audiences and thinking about audiences is critical to the field of any art. And you make this assertion that how audiences have experienced the arts has changed over time. How has it changed over time? In many important ways, and it's a big scope of, of change and of history. One thing I, I want to point out right from the top is that when I'm talking about audiences, I'm talking about European-derived audiences. And my work has been focused almost entirely on the journey from ancient Greece and Rome to through Europe and to the United States. So audiences, that's not a monolith, right? Audiences are everybody globally. And so I can't reduce what I'm saying to just that understanding. But if I'm talking about that history, we have a really very interesting shift over the period of time from ancient Greece, we could start with because that's where we have records, to the late 19th century into the 20th and now the 21st century as a way of changing that through the digital experience. If I had to articulate that very quickly, I'd say that we moved from very active, engaged, audience members both inside the venue, whatever the venue might be, 
as well as in the interpretive arena after the event is over, to very quieted, very internal, and not particularly engaged audience members in the 20th century. And that's a long, complicated history that brings us from this active engagement to this quiet, internalized, and to some extent, turned off engagement. Well, I'd like to explore that history because it is central to your scholarship, but I'd like to define certain words first. Okay. In your book, Audience Engagement and the Role of Arts Talk in the Digital Era, you use three terms with very specific meanings. The first is social interpretation, the second is arts experience, and the third is arts talk. What do you mean by social interpretation? So social interpretation is audience-produced meaning-making that occurs in and through public settings or public mechanisms of some kind or another. What would be an example of that? Social interpretation is something that happens in the lobby after the show is over, when people are talking to each other and they are engaged in their active, immediate experience of it. Social interpretation might also be the kind of conversation that an audience has together with each other in some kind of post-show facilitated dialogue. Social interpretation could also be, if we were interested and engaged, the audience's ability to tap into the meaning-making process in a more official way. And here's an example of that that goes on in the city of Detroit. They have this project called the iCritic Van, where there's a van that goes around to venues, hangs around outside, interviews people, tapes them, getting their feedback on their experience with, let's say, a symphony concert, and then airs that and puts it up on websites. And this, this is a way to make public what the audience is experiencing. The second term is arts experience, which you referred to previously. Any more about that term? Well, an experience is a thing that we undergo. I'm sort of very loosely paraphrasing Dewey here in this, but this is the notion that when you have an experience, you are changing. You are undergoing something. And in the process of undergoing, you have the potential to come out the other side differently. So an arts experience is by its definition rooted in the audience. The art event, the product, the thing, the play, the concert, its interpretation by actors, by musicians, is obviously integral and very important. But it's not the thing. The thing is the audience and their experience of it. And the last term is arts talk. What do you mean by arts talk and how does that differ from social interpretation? Well, arts talk is really just a, an active coinage that I came up with because I wanted people to think about talking as a primary way for social interpretation to occur. It's not the only way. People can engage in social interpretation through writing and through other means that are, are not specifically talk. But talking is one of the primary ways in which we interpret the world around us. And speech is often theorized as fundamental to human evolution and to the whole notion of our cognitive development, that we have speech because it is itself an interpretive uh, mechanism. So to me, it's pretty critical. And when I look at the way in which we interpret other forms of experience in our larger culture, we do that very actively through talk. Sports is a great example of it, but we have other excellent examples. I mean, I think restaurant talk is very vibrant in most parts of the United States, for example. And certainly politics talk. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's now apply those terms to the broad brush of history that we spoke of. So we have these terms, social interpretation, arts experience, and arts talk, and we mentioned how the general arts experience, how audiences engage with the arts, has changed. How has audience behavior changed over time? 
Well, if we take ourselves to, to Athens, and let's say it's 429 before Common Era, and it's the moment when Sophocles' play Oedipus Rex wins the competition for the best tragedy. That competition was called the City Dionysia, sometimes translated as the Greater Dionysia, and it occurred every spring. The audience of 15,000 Athenians was very active throughout the process. I do need to contextualize this so we don't think it was the democracy that we have in mind because those 15,000 Athenians were all white, male, landed gentry. They were citizens and that was the, those were the criteria for being a citizen. But in that context, you have a group of people who are there to impact the way in which these tragedies are chosen. Not all 15,000 people are voting, but in fact, among those 15,000, there are 10 representatives elected that basically represent the demos, and they are there to literally vote on the best tragedy. This is really interesting to me because we hold up Oedipus Rex as the ultimate, right? This is the play that gives us the Western standards from which we both derive new standards and we work against, right? We try to become different from. And that play was chosen through a competition. So it's sort of relationship to the way in which we think about sporting activities, for example, is pretty firm and I think surprising to people. It was so active in the theater of Dionysus that they did have proctors or ushers that went around shutting people up by smacking them on the back with a, a cane if they were too disruptive. Or at least we have a little evidence of that from, from some of the material from the period. But in effect, people were very engaged. Now, what does engagement mean? To us, it means that everybody's really quiet and still and will not disturb the artwork. But that is not what we understand, again, from public records. And this is, an, this is a crowd that is there. It's an open-air theater. It's daylight. People are coming and going. They're eating. They're conducting business. They're quite engaged with each other and with the performance. And that was okay. It wasn't seen as some disruption to the sacred nature of the artwork, right? This was just how you process the art, very actively, physically and mentally and socially. If we skip ahead to Shakespeare's time, we're in the Globe Theater, same deal, very busy place, very active, different parts of society represented, probably more thoroughly than in the ancient Greek space. And those people are also coming and going, eating, talking, drinking, and paying attention. They're not voting on what is the best, but of course they are really, because it's the, the, it's the public opinion that makes the plays valuable and the playwrights valuable and brings people in. A very active space is what we know about the Globe Theater. And that kind of active uh, space in, in the theater context is also true of other forms of art. We know, for example, that concert performance, which is a late development really, but as it begins to emerge, it comes out of people's personal salons and into more public arenas and, and remains quite an active space with a lot of interaction from the audience. That lasts up until the 20th century. The riot that occurred around the Rite of Spring, for example, um, Stravinsky's groundbreaking and rule-breaking work, plenty of documentation of the audience's role in that. So it, it's not just theater, it's other forms of art in which we, we see this actively engaged audience. And there are many, many examples in my book and in other people's work, other cultural historians, where we learn about the way in which audiences were so engaged in the process, sometimes disruptive of the art event, sometimes not, but clearly they were given the agency to make the meaning. There's no question about that. The larger historical context lets us know that audiences were in charge of meaning making. That carries through America in the 19th century, including how audiences responded to a play like Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
Yeah, no question. Audiences' engagement with theater uh, in the 19th century in the United States was extremely active. Again, you have a house full of different classes of society. They are separated literally by the area of the theater. But their interaction was pretty real. And there are wonderful newspaper articles that I found in my research referring to the audience's behavior at the theater the night before and complaints or sometimes praise of that, depending on the perspective of the person. But very active places, tomatoes were thrown, no question about that, and other kinds of very physical responses. It's really interesting, for example, that when we use the term applause or clapping to mean the thing we do when we put our hands together, but during the 19th century, audiences' responses were were much more physical and full-bodied. So stomping of feet was a much more common way to respond, whistling, catcalls, all that kind of stuff. And when that audience behavior begins to be restricted in the late 19th century, the restrictors point directly to that. No more catcalls, for example, in the theater. There was a change. Something happened that led to audiences behaving very differently for the first time in centuries. And in your writing, you note two causes for the change. One, a technological reason, and the other, a sociological reason. What were those two causes? Well, technologically, the simple moment for change is the invention of the incandescent lamp and electricity. In 1881, the first fully electric theater was opened, the Savoy Theater in London. And very quickly thereafter, most theaters, most venues, of, regardless of what the kind of art form was being performed, were electrified. This means that for the first time in history, the audience is fully in the dark. Prior to that, we had gaslighting. There was the capacity to somewhat darken the audience, but not entirely, because you can't fully extinguish the, the gas lamps. And prior to that, with candlelight also, some attempts to control the relationship between the light on stage and the light in the audience. But with the incandescent lamp, we have the audience fully in the dark. And that's a metaphor, right? And it's beautiful because it really does point to the moment when this urge to have audiences quiet themselves down and to shift their interpretive process from this external social process to one that is internal and private happened. And with the uh, invention of electricity and lighting, we were able to do that. The second cause you point to is a sociological one. You speak about the sacralization of the arts. What do you mean by that? Well, that's a term that I borrow from Lawrence Levine and his excellent book, Highbrow, Lowbrow, which I highly recommend to people interested in this subject. And when Levine talks about the sacralization of the arts, what he means is that we're moving in the beginning in the mid-19th century and culminating toward the end of the 19th century into a time when audiences were encouraged and in some cases forced to internalize their interpretive process and to remove themselves essentially from the meaning-making operation. So the audience is no longer invited to be a meaning-maker. They're asked to be a consumer, a quiet consumer. Why? Well, there are a lot of different interpretations or theories about that. One of them is that with theorists like Matthew Arnold, the English poet and cultural theorist, the idea that the masses would be raised up through art was positioned in American society with the emergence of the middle class, or really the professional class. And the idea there was that you could raise your status in the economic marketplace if you were a more sophisticated arts consumer. But to be a sophisticated arts consumer, you had to know how to behave inside of the venue. And that meant 
that you didn't stomp your feet, you didn't catcall, you were quiet, you were polite, and you kept your interpretation largely to yourself. Lynn, on this point, in a chapter you wrote called In and Out of the Dark, you made a remark about how audience behavior has changed. I'm wondering if you might read that. What previous generations of arts consumers took for granted, the sovereignty over their own cultural choices and the attendant authority to ascribe meaning in a publicly valued manner, contemporary adult arts consumers do not even consider as a possibility. After all, they've been taught to remain quiet, to keep their feelings hidden inside a calm, still body, and to wait for the appropriate moment to express an opinion. Further, they've been conditioned to wait to receive meaning from the experts, the artist, the newspaper critic, the professor, and other more sophisticated patrons who have somehow earned the right to post an opinion. What has been the consequence of the quieting of audiences? The consequence has been that we have seen a dramatic drop in the number of Americans interested in attending the so-called serious arts. This began in the 1980s and 90s and continues to grow in alarming numbers. When you take away people's right to interpret meaning and value, you take away their interest in participating. You write that the arts experience should be more like sports. How so? Well, sports invite interpretation all the time. And the professional sports industry, as it evolved in the United States beginning in the early 20th century, has been very cognizant of the relationship between selling tickets and inviting active, engaged interpretation. So for a sports fan, that process of participating in the sports experience begins with everything that precedes the football game. Let's say it's the Super Bowl. Everything that precedes that, which includes all of the media coverage, which itself is theoretical and analytical and invites sports fans themselves to be theorists and to analyze and to participate in that kind of sports talk around it, that which carries you into the event itself, the Super Bowl, and then is followed by a robust period of further analysis and theorizing, which is in the hands of the sports fan primarily, and is supplemented or supported to some extent by the professional interpreters. One thing I like to say to arts organizations, arts workers, when I'm talking to them about this material is let's imagine the Super Bowl without the preceding opportunities for analysis and without the post opportunities. And let's further take the audience, the sports fan, during the Super Bowl and put them in the dark and tell them that they need to be quiet and physically still. Do you have the Super Bowl? You don't. But that's what we've done to the arts. And when we have an understanding of how the arts were contextualized in previous times, eras, we get a better sense of what we've done here. Lynn, in concert halls and theater productions, would you prefer it if the lights were up and audience could make noise during the performance? That's the classic question I always get, and it's a great one. I want to answer that by pointing out who I am as a playwright and what my reactions as an artist are. So when my play is being performed and I'm in, in the house, if someone moves, I hear it and it bothers me. And of course, I'm extremely sensitive to the notion that my play will not receive its full reception if there's an interruption to the experience. But as a historian, I know that's not true. And also, really, as an arts consumer, I know that's not true. I know that people are capable of processing a lot of different stimuli. We do it all day long, and we can do it inside the auditorium. I don't want the lights up, and I 
also don't argue that we should be shifting back to the theater of Dionysus and to audiences coming and going and eating and playing cards and moving around and carrying on. It's more about our attitude about the audience's right to interpret that I think we need to look to the past for, not the physical behavior inside the venue. When we go see Shakespeare in the park, it works just fine, doesn't it? It does. And we go into that process with the understanding that there is going to be noise, that there are going to be a variety of stimuli that impact the experience, and we're okay with that. Let me take you to a moment in art history and have you reflect on it. When Miles Davis turns his back on the audience while playing jazz? Yeah, and I think with that example, it's partially specific to Miles Davis and to his development as an artist in a larger context of the evolution of jazz as this form of American popular music and its journey over the 20th century where it becomes really an elitist form of music. And it, it's, it's partially about this process of the sacralization, that the artist becomes the sacred center and the audience is just not important. And so that's like a literal embodiment of that. The audience is not important and the audience doesn't deserve his attention. I am an amateur jazz singer and I've spent a fair amount of time performing professionally, you know, getting paid for, for what that's worth. <laughs> and over the last 20 years, in every city that I've lived, I've watched jazz clubs close down, close down, close down. It happened in Pittsburgh. It happened in Maine. It's happening here in Charlotte. The longstanding weekly jam session, professional jam session headed by Bill Hanna just ended after something like 30 years, maybe more. What is that about? There's no audience for jazz. It's very small audience. Why? Well, partially because jazz became an academic exercise and does not relate to the larger public in important ways, and maybe partially because this, this experience of interpreting it has gone away. You know, when you look at the clips from 52nd Street in New York in 1954, you see a wildly engaged audience, right? You just don't see that now. In your work, in talking about social interpretation, you make a distinction between a linear pattern of communication versus a circular pattern of communication. What do you mean? Well, I'm borrowing that from a lot of scholarship in the larger context of linguistics and, and other cultural studies. But a linear pattern of communication is one that is rooted in the idea that you progress towards something and you leave behind what has already been developed. And it's also rooted in a sense that it's a communication process which in the digital era is described as one to the many, right? So it comes out of a single source and then eventually ends up in the ears or minds of many people. A circular pattern of communication is culturally situated just as linear patterns are. And circular patterns are determined by their desire to get back to the source and to bring everyone along with them as they do. So it's more rooted in the idea of many to many in terms of who is being communicated with and by whom. Circular patterns of communication are more common in other cultures than the European-derived Eurocentric cultures. Linear patterns are more common in the Euro tradition. You spoke earlier about City Dionysia, the annual religious and cultural festival in Athens. And during that time, playwrights like Sophocles engaged an active Greek audience. My mind went to the Apollo Theater in New York and how active the African-American audience is interacting with the performance on stage, representing more of this circular pattern of communication. Can you speak more about that? Yes, and that's a wonderful connection there between the city Dionysia and the Apollo Theater. The Apollo Theater 
has been in operation, I don't know how long. I, I'm, I'm not particularly well-versed in its history. But what I do know about the Apollo is that the amateur night and the larger context for the audience engagement with that is profound and central to its mission. And the audiences go there to interpret the value of those performances, and they do so in this really public way. And now there's a digital application for that. The Apollo now has an app. So not only can you be there in person, but you can also spread your interpretation digitally far and wide. This is an African-American context. And the idea of a circular pattern of communication, which would invite everyone to participate in the whole process of that, is clearly manifest in the way in which the audience responds at the Apollo. That tradition is manifest in other African-American cultural forms. The black church is rooted in a call and response nature that is full-bodied and authentic. And call and response is therefore very important to other operations within the black community. And it's a pretty interesting point of contention when you look at, for example, criticisms of audience behavior that you'll find in some online venues, for example, a critique of black audiences disrupting a play and the counter critique that that is part of what the artwork is intended to do and very clear cultural guidelines for that built into it. It's fascinating and it's been a rub. It's been a tension. I personally think we would all be much better off if we were more inclined to accept that kind of call and response. Lynn, if great art is great because it yields itself to a variety of interpretations across time and place, can we call any art great if audiences are no longer interpreting what the art is? Wow. <laughs> the answer is no. And of course, yes, because audiences are always interpreting. We don't do anything as human beings without interpreting it. That is what our cognition is rooted in. So every move that we make is an act of interpretation. So art is always being interpreted. But if art is to be vibrant, and I think this is where your question is intended to lead us, if it is to be part of our life, if it is to be part of the fabric of our cultural life and our everyday existence, we need it to be available for interpretation in a public way. And we need to invite people to get back into this active and engaged process. Interpretation is a practice. If we are no longer practicing interpretation, does art become meaningless? Well, you, you point to something very important, and I talk about this in the book a fair amount, and that is that when audiences are shut out of the interpretive process, then they don't know how to engage with a productive interpretive construct. And that's a problem. Artists and arts workers in general, certainly arts producers and administrators, are very resistant to inviting the audience into the interpretive process because they say that the interpretation that they get is not very well informed and that it can often be very personal and stupid really, you know, just not valuable. And we all know that we get a fair amount of that on the social media platforms, right? Thoughtless sort of knee-jerk responses. But my response to arts administrators or artists who resist this is that that may be true some of the time, but I see incredibly intelligent interpretation happening on online platforms all the time in areas where that interpretation is invited in a genuine way. I'll take television as an example. So we have now, we're in this era of premium television where just first-rate art is being produced. 
And if you look at the audience interpretation surrounding a show like The Sopranos, for example, it's brilliant. There is really amazing interpretation going on there. Why? And why is that happening, but we don't see sort of the same level of engagement and competence in the interpretation of Shakespeare play or the latest symphony concert? It can't be because the audience isn't capable of it. I just don't, I don't buy that. It's because they aren't invited, they aren't practiced, they don't feel welcome. And so they're intimidated and they move away from it. You know, there's a, a quote that I love by uh, an educational theorist by the name of Thomas Saz, and um, I'm going to paraphrase. I won't get it exactly right. But he says that true learning is by definition a loss of self-esteem. And thus, small children, before they have a sense of their own self-worth, are capable of learning, but very important people are not. And I find that brilliant. To learn means that you acknowledge that you didn't know, and you have to adjust your sense of self in order to incorporate that new learning and to move forward. So the parallel with the arts is, if we take, let's take your average banker here in Charlotte, okay? This is a, this is a smart woman, well-educated, got an MBA or <laughs> the equivalent, and she has never gone to the theater very much in her life, but she wants to start. So she attends a new play, and the play is experimental in its structure. Its dramaturgy is experimental, and she's never seen or really read or heard anything quite like this. When she goes to the play, she has no preparation because there's no article in the newspaper. There's no discussion of that play on the theater's website. There's no way to sort of get a sense of this new play. Then she watches the play, and then afterwards, there's no context for discussion. And maybe she went with a friend, and neither one of them really get it. So mm, they sort of shrug their shoulders and maybe say a few things, but there's no investigation of it, and there's no help to investigate it. Psychologically, what occurs is that she says to herself, boy, that made me uncomfortable because I'm used to understanding things and I didn't understand that. And then pretty quickly we go from un discomfort because we didn't understand something to distaste. And what lingers then is, I don't really like contemporary theater. I don't think I'm going to go again. What is an arts organization to do to re-engage an audience and to help audiences co-author and make meaning? Accept the fact that it's the arts experience that matters and not just the artwork itself. And accept the fact that the audience should be in charge of the meaning making operation. And what arts organizations have to do is to engage more actively in this larger arts experience. And that might mean offering audiences opportunities to interpret offering audiences opportunities to learn more about the artist or the form prior to the experience. And it also might well mean giving audiences the agency to talk to each other and to engage with each other. And there's a lot of that going on in the arts field. It's, it's happening in a big way right now. Lynn, where did you grow up? I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My father was a chemist and an amateur photographer. My mom was trained as a nurse. She didn't work past, I think, just uh, before she had children. She also was an amateur singer and um, sang with a quartet while, while I was young. What was defining about your childhood? What was defining about my childhood was that I had two parents who were completely loving and supportive, but also real and critical when it was important to be critical 
and with real expectations about our behavior in the world, not to become some great professional, right? But rather to become a person who had an ethical center and a moral compass, who used that all the time. And they showed my sisters and I how to do that. And they're still showing us how to do it. They're both still alive at 87. And I, I love that you asked me that question because I love to be able to, to honor my parents. Lynn, you went to Oberlin College. What do you remember about Oberlin? Mm, it blew my mind. It was a place of great awakening for me because I grew up in a, a white middle-class suburban suburb of Pittsburgh. There was one black family and, uh, it, you know, it was not a place of great cultural difference, to put it mildly. And I went to Oberlin and it was even though Oberlin is in the middle of nowhere, the uh, student population was very urban in its origin, and the arts were incredibly important. And Oberlin, when I went there in the late 70s, was still very attached to its activist period of the 60s and earlier 70s. So there was a wonderful sense of social justice and the potential for social change felt very rich and real. What were you interested in at Oberlin? Well, I was always interested in theater. My interest in theater started in high school. And, and like all people who are theater professionals, I started wanting to be an actor because that's the rule. <laughs> and when I went to Oberlin, I wasn't a theater major for one reason, and that was because I was afraid of the technical requirement because you had to get up on the cherry picker and I didn't want to do it. So I didn't want to take the tech class. So I was a theater minor that I swear that's the reason. And the irony of course, is that a few years after graduating from Oberlin, I'm up on a cherry picker for the theater company that I was founding and working with, but I've always been interested in theater and I spent all of my time really with the theater department at Oberlin. But what is it about theater that attracts you? That's such a good question. I feel as if my interest was so early that I never really analyzed it. It just uh, was. It was just an interest. Fundamentally, I think of myself as a storyteller. And I'm a storyteller as a historian in the same way that I am as a playwright. So the storytelling process in a theatrical context just really compels me. And I think the other thing that I love about theater is that its place in the live context and its structure, which is all about telling the very end of the story, right? We don't, it's not narrative like a novel. We don't tell the whole story. We, we just get to the highlights and really to the crisis and the climax. That's the, that's the definition of a dramatic structure. It's so exciting, and the potential for that on stage, and particularly the way in which something can be theatricalized and made really big, just attracts me. You earned your PhD at the University of Pittsburgh, and your academic career began at the University of Pittsburgh. How did your scholarship evolve? I started, because I have a PhD in theater history and performance studies, I started by writing a book that came out of my dissertation on dance, particularly the emergence of dance criticism in the American context. And I've always been very interested in dance. And I worked as a dance critic for uh, the, the Pittsburgh Press, the big daily newspaper, before it went out of business. I love it. I love dance. I'm not a dancer. I, I don't practice, but I love looking at it, and I certainly loved interpreting it. And from there, I went on to write a book about Pittsburgh's theater history, which I really conceived of as a cultural history of Pittsburgh through the lens of theater, and enjoyed that as well, very much. I also published a play and had lots of plays produced during that period of time, so I had that parallel development. And ultimately, I think I got into audiences and theorizing about audience behavior primarily through my work with the Heinz Endowments in Pittsburgh. The Heinz Endowments is an 
an amazing foundation that has different prongs, one of them being arts and culture. And I got to know the head of the foundation, the arts and culture section. Her name is Janet Sarbaugh. And I started to talk to her about how I was confused by the whole marketing rhetoric using the term audience engagement when it didn't appear to have anything to do with audience engagement. All it had to do with was butts and seats, right? And Janet was intrigued by the things that I was saying to her and invited me to do a project with the Heinz Endowments in which we developed a four-year project for a group of arts organizations in Pittsburgh ranging from tiny little photography gallery to the Pittsburgh Symphony, one of the largest symphonies in the world. And that project involved giving them a chunk of money to develop audience engagement experiences that would bring the audiences into the interpretive function. And I, I created that and facilitated that, and it was wonderful. And from there, I knew that I had the material for both articles and books. In 2008, you left the university and went to Colby College in Maine. Was going to Colby College a bit like returning to Oberlin College? Well, I thought it was going to be, and I was seeking out the the opportunity to work with undergraduates again, uh, because at Pitt I mostly worked with doctoral students. But in truth, Colby is a very different place than Oberlin. Colby's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful institution. It's not a politically progressive place. And so because Oberlin was, that idea turned out not to be <laughs> true. That was okay because Colby, Colby students are, are excellent students and very good people. And it was my deep pleasure to work with them. In 2016, you left Colby and came to the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Why? I was looking at myself, feeling a little bit of wanderlust, as I tend to do professionally, and I thought that there was one more chunk to my career. Since I had worked at a Research One institution with doctoral students, and then I had worked with liberal arts students in, a, in an elite place, you know, with wonderful students, I was missing, I think, the opportunity to help students in a way that was more concrete. At Colby, students arrive already in the economic pipeline. And that's to say that they're mostly middle class students who have been privileged in their upbringing and are already really set. We were there helping them along, but their course in life is pretty, pretty prescribed. But there were students at Colby who came from much less privileged circumstances. And I started working with them, and I gained a reputation as being one of the professors who mentored first-generation college students. And from that experience, I realized I wanted to do a lot more of that. I wanted that to be more part of my life. Lynn, in your writing, you posed a question. What is this thing called meaning? What does meaning mean? To you? I think I alluded to this earlier. Meaning is who we are as human beings. It's why we're not animals in the way that my great cat Frank is. Because Frank doesn't make meaning, but I do. So everything that I encounter in the world, I interpret. And in that interpretive process, I describe to myself and maybe to others what it means, why it means, and along the way, I place some value on it. And the way that I can place value on it is that I know what it means. So I think it's just the human condition. Is there a connection between making meaning in the arts and making meaning in our lives? Yes. The arts exist because they offer us a way to explain things through metaphor. And when we have the chance to explain things through metaphor, we get to understand the world without having to tie everything to pedestrian, everyday, 
language and constructs. We get to point to these metaphors and understand things differently. So the meaning embodied in those metaphors is what we're after, right? That's what we're interpreting. I, I wouldn't want to live in a world without art, <laughs> and I think we want to be able to participate in that as fully as possible. I wonder if there is a crisis of meaning in the modern world because we are no longer practiced in interpreting our lives. I wonder about that too, and I think there is. I, I, there's much discussion of that, right? And while the digital context is a fantastic one for many aspects of our lives, and it is a democratizing context for sure, it's also dangerous because it, it's a shortcut and it perhaps thus short circuits the harder work of interpretation. And it is hard. It's hard to make meaning. It's not a facile thing. It hurts the brain. <laughs> If the arts are an expression of our lives and we're no longer able to interpret the arts, we're no longer able to interpret our lives. Yeah, that's a great thesis. I'm going to have to borrow that. <laughs> Thanks for your time today, Lynn. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Lynn Connor is Professor of Theater Arts and Chair of the Department of Theater at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. She earned a BA in English Literature from Oberlin College, an MA in Theater Arts from the State University of New York at Stony Brook, and a PhD in Theater History and Performance Studies from the University of Pittsburgh. And now, a personal word. At the heart of Lynn Connor's scholarship about social interpretation of the arts, or the role the audience plays in the value assigned to a work of art is the assertion that audiences co-author meaning. Her work explores how audience participation in meaning making has changed over time and why it matters. She notes that the audience experience shapes the expression and perception of art. But what does it mean to make meaning? What does meaning mean? Here is how I interpret what Lynn means by meaning-making. The audience is involved along with the artist and critic and other constituencies in authoring what is said and understood about the art that is produced and experienced. The more the audience is involved in interpreting the art, the more the audience finds the art experience meaningful. So goes her assertion. Language here is important. The art experience and the art object are two different things. An audience can find great meaning interpreting a work of art they find meaningless. For example, they can enjoy talking about a play they didn't very much like. An audience can also find meaningless what is said about a work of art they find meaningful. They can dismiss what is said about a play they love. This happens all the time in sports. Think of sports talk which Lynn invites us to do when imagining what art's talk could be. Sports fans can find meaning talking about a team that is meaningless to them. The Cleveland Browns may mean nothing to them, but they will talk about the Browns. The talking is meaningful, not necessarily the object of what they are talking about. They also can find no meaning whatsoever in what is said about a team that is quite meaningful to them. The Carolina Panthers are meaningful not what critics might say about them. This is true of our lives as well. There are the lives we lead and what we say about our lives. Our lives are meaningful in our existence. Our lives are further meaningful to the extent that we interpret and value them. Any existentialist philosopher will tell you the same. Just as there is arts talk and sports talk, so there is life talk. The more we think and talk about our lives, the more meaning we make, and the more meaningful our lives. We give our life meaning in the consideration of it. How might we consider our lives? We can curate our experiences. We can share our memories. We can discuss what is happening. We can learn about other lives led. We can be grateful 
we can state goals and aspirations. We can live with greater intention. Of course, we can let all thinking go and just be. We can be mute, and our lives are just as meaningful. Some philosophers of language may disagree. We can say this: meaning making is what we do. We make meaning in response to primal existential concerns. We declare what is significant so that we might live on. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates Andy Go, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.